I think we're good. All right, next slide, please. So my name is Teresa Becker and I am hosting this Wildlife Wednesday. I'm with the uh, Alaska Wildlife Alliance. And so first of all, we'll cover just some really quick virtual engagement guidelines. Um, obviously no Zoom bombing. I, we do ask people to keep their video and their microphone turned off to kind of help and save bandwidth. Also, we encourage, we generally encourage viewing in the full screen mode, but one of the things that uh, Todd and I talked about was that sometimes when you're in the full screen mode, pictures of people and, and the speakers block portions of the, um, the presentation, is particularly when they're in slides like these are. And so if you find that happening, go to the upper right hand corner and go to view. And I have mine set in gallery view side by side. And that's just so that um, um, I can see kind of everything that's going on on the slides and at the same time see um, um, who, all the, who all the speakers are and who's all out there. But, but play around with that a little bit if there's some portion of it that you can't see. Um, we will have time for questions at the end of the presentation, but what we encourage people to do is to ask a question using the chat box at the bottom and then just type it in. And then as soon as uh, the presentation is over with, I will go back through the questions. And if they hadn't already been answered later, I will, I will try and ask Todd those questions as we go along. And then beyond that, we'll, we'll have some availability for people to throw out some extra questions. Mostly, most importantly, enjoy and learn something new. Next slide. So we are Alaska Wildlife Alliance and um, we're an Alaska-based nonprofit protecting Alaska's wildlife through citizen mobilization, advocacy, and education. And I put our website up here in the left-hand corner. If you hadn't had an opportunity to go out and visit our website, please do. This is a very good organization. Next slide. So tomorrow is Earth Day. And to celebrate that, um, Alaska Wildlife Alliance is having an Earth Week. And again, um, at the bottom of the screen, you'll see the website address, alaskawildlife.org forward slash Earth Week. Go out and take a look at that if you get a chance. We're having a fun little fundraiser. And um, we have listed up here uh, some of the sort of lesser known Alaskan wildlife species. And to the left is the tufted puffin. The middle is a wood frog and the, the far right is a ribbon seal. So we're having a little competition and for a $10 donation, you can pick your favorite lesser known Alaskan uh, species and, and only do this in $10 increments if you're interested in doing it because for every $10 you put in there, you get entered to win a drawing for two bigger prizes. The first is a round trip ticket for two to, on Alaska Railroad from Anchorage to Denali for summer 2021 travel. And the second is a mission for up to four people to the Alaska escape rooms in Anchorage. Go ahead, next slide. Another thing I want to do is give you a quick update. I, most of you might know that Alaska Wildlife Alliance and Kenai Peninsula College are two of the host partners for the Alaska Beluga Monitoring Project. Um, and we are specifically the host agencies um, for the Kenai and the Kasilof River. I am the Middle Inlet Coordinator for that project. And I just wanted to give an, everybody an update for those of you who may or may not know that belugas come into the Kenai and Kasilof rivers. Um, we have been watching for them now since March 15th and we'll march for our spring season and we'll monitor through uh, May 15th. They first came into the river on March 27th and since March 30th, they've been in almost every single day, not every single day, but almost every single day. Um, on one day, 23 of them came in at one time, on one day, 19, on another day, 16. On different days, they might come in in smaller groups or groups of two or three and, uh, or, or maybe three different groups, um, but they are coming into the Kenai River and many people don't know that they go up to 
eight to 10 miles up the river searching for prey, and especially this time of year after a, a long, hard winter. If you're interested in getting alerts about the belugas, you can text the word beluga to the phone number on the screen, 833-541-0408. And every day that we see them, we'll send an alert out just to tell you that we've seen belugas on the river again. Go ahead, next slide, please. This is just a, a quick slide to, to tell you about our next Wildlife Wednesday. We don't have a lot of information up there yet because we're still working out some of the details, but it's May 12, 2021, and it's about climate change in Alaska's ocean. This is a very big deal right now. Climate change is happening in Alaska at, at least two times faster than it's happening anywhere else in the world. And I know everybody's seeing a lot of information about climate change. And so if you get a chance, come out and watch this Wildlife Wednesday. All right, now I have the, the honor to introduce our speaker, Todd Eskelin. Uh, Todd's professional interest in birds began at Lewis and Clark College in Portland, Oregon. Since then, he has worked as the bander in charge at the fledgling Alaska Bird Observatory. He's done several stints with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services uh, training banders and setting up and operating map stations for Alaska Pen Peninsula, uh, I'm going to say this wrong anyway, Besharoff National Wildlife Refuge and Eisenbeck National Wildlife Refuge, which is in the Aleutians. He eventually settled at Kenai National Wildlife Refuge in 2001, where he continues to work as a wildlife biologist. Thank you so much for being here, Todd. Thank you, and uh, can you hear me okay, I'm assuming? Yes, yes, just fine. Perfect, perfect. Well, thank you to Alaska Wildlife Alliance and you know, Teresa and Nikki for hosting this whole um, speaker series. It's been wonderful watching the other talks and, and thanks for inviting me. And, and on a beautiful spring evening that we, after a long winter, I actually really thank everybody who, who chimed in um, to join us for the talk because I know it's beautiful out there right now. Uh, let me see if I can do this. Um, I'm going to hide. We, I, Teresa did mention um, how the video panels sometimes do block your your view, and and I just kind of want to re-emphasize that. There's a couple of slides where there's graphs and things that that your video panel may actually block a, an important part of the graph. So do know that if you're on an iPhone, you can move that um, little zoom video panel of my mug around so you can see other parts of the slide. So um, as we as we said, the, the talk is on hummingbird banding on the Kenai Peninsula. And I think probably the, the first thing I want to do is kind of give you a little bit of my background, how I found myself banding hummingbirds. Um, this does not want to advance as as I wanted to. As, as Teresa said, you know, I, I went to college, came back looking for a job, and I bounced all around the state. Um, for that, though, I kind of want to encourage anybody who has kids that are going to college. I, I went to college without any real direction. I wasn't looking at birds at all until my junior year in college, I think. I took my first ornithology class and kind of got hooked a little, and then before you knew it, I was doing independent bird banding projects on campus, um, looking at how nesting, which which nesting species ranged further around campus, and 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 all that was possible because I was learning learning how to band birds and and marking them in a way that that I could identify that same bird. Uh, fast forward to um, my career starting running all over the state and. I put some of the I put some of the photos up for you just to see I've I've had you know phenomenal projects where I've got to go up and and band uh, spectacle lighters or or you know you you name it and and at one point I had looked I kind of tried to tally um, because most of these weren't projects that were banded under my banding permit they're they're other people's banding permits but at one point I had banded like twenty five 
to it's between 25 and 30,000 birds. And um, it was kind of a, didn't realize it happened, you know? Um, but then eventually I got really attracted to, to hummingbirds and, and the bird banding lab requires a lot, um, a lot more scrutiny, a lot more training in order to get um, the permissions to ban hummingbirds. And so I think in 2017 was when I really in earnest started looking because we had hummingbirds here on the Kenai in a slightly increasing numbers. And I had no way of tracking whether that was the same individual or not. And I realized I needed to, needed to figure out how to get those permissions to, to ban hummingbirds. And so 2018, I was approved to go and train um, with uh, one of the mentors that, um, you know, just by, by chance, it ended up being, I think, probably the best fit for me that, that ever could have been. And um, so in 2018, I went down to Idaho and I trained with Fred Bassett. And I probably had a leg up on most of the people he trained because I'd already banded 25 to 30,000 birds, mostly songbirds. So I'd handled a lot of small birds, but, but hummingbirds are, are a different realm um, than, than even, even chickadees and kinglets. It's just a, it's a different, different beast. So um, I was able to go and spend a week with, with Fred doing a road trip all over, all over the far stretches of Idaho and you know Alaskan Alaskan guy down here in 102 degree heat that was that was another uh, adventure for me um, but it was actually really good and and um, I think part of the part of you know one of the best parts of the training was all of these additional factors the heat the being tired from doing road trips and whatnot and then kind of this new experience with Hummers was ideal because it puts you under the the pressure that they wanted to see that you would be capable of handling um, handling these fragile birds in a you know in a situation um, and not not panicking if if things weren't going perfectly. So a lot of the a lot of the training was intentional um, and it was just a great experience. And and Fred knew where his hosts had the most rufous hummingbirds because he knew that's what I'd be handling the most of. So um, it was it was just a great fit. And, but I mean, that 102 degree heat, there was times when my digital scale stopped working. We had to move into the shade a little bit because the scale stopped working. So um, one of the other, you know, stressors that they would do their, their banding jokes would be to catch one of these large grasshoppers that was actually the same size as the hummingbirds I was banding. And they would catch all these hummingbirds, put them in bags, and I was there at the table banding, and then I'd you know, grab the, grab the uh, grasshopper. And, and, and it was just another one of those things that um, it was perfect because it just tested you. And, and I, I passed the, uh, I passed into the club. So after I got my, after I got my banning permit, then I was, woohoo, I'm ready, uh, um, ready to tackle hummingbirds on the Kenai. And not that many people know that there's there's now two regular species of, of hummingbirds on the Kenai. If you knew about hummingbirds in the past, you knew that well, the Kenai Peninsula gets a, gets a small population of rufous hummingbirds. Um, but we now also have Anna's hummingbirds um, regularly, annually on the Kenai. And these are just some nice examples of um, I don't know if you can see my cursor on there, but a, a nice rufous male. They're kind of hard to miss. They're bright orange, um, gorget, and and Anna's have this, you know, beautiful rosy kind of fuchsia color, and it actually the the sparkle extends up over the top of the head as well. And then uh, this is a female, so females do get some gorget feathers. Um, but they're always centered in the throat, and I'll, I'll get to that a little bit later. So let's first start with Rufus. I just want to give you a quick little bit on, on the fascinating aspects to Rufus life on the Kenai. This is a, from starting on the top left is an adult male that we saw earlier. 
And then this is an adult female. And as you can see, they they do get gorget feathers or these they get these bright orange gorget feathers, but they're always centrally located on the throat. And then down here on the going clockwise is a is an immature male. And he's got a few of the little spangles in his gorget. And you'll see there's a couple that are out here, out here on the side. And then also you can see a lot more um, rufous or, or orangey brown in the tail. So this would be a juvenile male. And then, then the juvenile female may have a couple of spangles, but they're gonna be central on the throat. And then also you'll see not as much rufous in the tail. Um, Range maps anymore are kind of kind of dated just about every year with climate change. So um, I don't know the date on this map, but generally this map is is accurate in that Rufus breed from like Northern California up to Alaska. We know they're on the Kenai Peninsula now as well, and then they winter mostly down in Mexico. Um, West of Mexico City in that zone is a really, really dense area for Rufus, but they also winter um, in the southeast U.S. across those southern Gulf states and just pay extra attention to those little blue circles because those little blue circles in Florida, Georgia, Alabama, those are important um, from the standpoint of, of where we used to think that those were, um, what would you call them, vagrants or, or birds that went the wrong way. And, and for decades, we thought that, that those birds were, were not going to make it through the winter. Winter's too harsh there compared to where they're supposed to be down in Mexico. But it was um, Bob, Bob and Martha Sargent who started banding them. And then they trained others, a whole, whole cadre of others like my, my mentor, Fred Bassett. And they started banding these these winter hummingbirds, these western hummingbirds over in in southeast U.S. And all of a sudden, they started coming back to the same house every winter. And pretty soon, they, you know, one hummingbird had returned to the same house for seven or eight winters in a row. And they realized this is completely intentional. They they knew where they were going, and they and they chose to be down there. So that's just a interesting part of Rufus life that we're starting to learn. The other, the other thing that um, is really not totally unique to Rufus, but it's unique in the sense that they have a different migration route for their northern trip and a different, um, on, the, on the northern trip, they're on the west coast. On the southern trip, they go down the Rockies. And uh, some of my bander friends in, in Canada at Rocky Point described it as a racetrack. And I, I thought that was actually really fitting that, that um, rather than taking, you know, a different avenue um, from Alaska, like ducks have a, have a, a north or, I mean, a, a Pacific and a central flyway, these guys actually do like a racetrack route. But it perfectly fits because in the spring, they're taking advantage of all the flowers along the coast. And in Colorado, those, those flowers are under snow in the spring when they're migrating up. And so um, on their southward route, they're hitting all those alpine, alpine flowers along the, along the Rockies. And again, this, this range map doesn't quite get to where we have humming, hummingbirds on the Kenai, but but those things are, are changing rapidly with climate. Let's see. So here is what I pulled from eBird. And eBird's a wonderful resource if everybody uses it. Um, this is humming, this is Rufus hummingbird sighting all time in, in South Central Alaska that have been entered in eBird. And you can see we, we have Rufus sightings all the way up up north of Palmer, um, down along the west coast of the peninsula and, and you know, Prince William Sound. This next part I did, I overlaid the, the actual breeding area that as, as far as we know right now, they're heavily breeding in, in Prince William Sound. 
they at Whittier they kind of carry over to to Portage and and uh, definitely make you know there's there's been breeders in um, like Bird Creek area um, maybe as far as McHugh Creek but um, you know we're we're getting close to Anchorage and and then Hope I banded banded um, birds breeding in Hope as you continue down along the outer coast. Seward is a is a nice heavy breeding area, and then they they go inland in Seward to at least Bear Lake, but folks in Moose Pass aren't seeing um, being Rufus yet. So then they carry on along around the coast to, to Port Graham, Nanwalek, Seldovia, Jackalof Bay, sure, maybe maybe up the bay as far as Halibut Cove or or, or Bear Cove. But so far, we have not found them breeding on the Homer side of the bay, and so I'm hoping to hoping to show you why I think that'll probably be changing in the near future, and and one of the reasons to encourage folks to get some feeders out here and there. So that is this is just kind of fun. I like to push eBird because I'm one of the reviewers, but. Um, this is kind of fun because what I was doing was looking at eBird sightings as they're coming in. And so this was March 30th, um, 2021. And you can see we had a heavy snowfall. And so what appeared to be from these sightings is that they were all, all the Rufus were just stacked up in, in Vancouver, waiting for a little bit more of the snow to melt along the coast. So they could so they could continue to travel up, and um, there's a couple of couple of reasons for that. One, I mean they 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 do eat a lot of bugs and stuff, but they really they really seem to target um, rubus species like salmonberry and some of the currants um, because they always are the the first things out that that flower, and often they flower before um, before they're even leafing. You know, they're 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 just really quick out of the gates to flower. So, and then also, people will wonder what this little dot is up in Kodiak because this is just in 2021. Well, we had our first bird ever documented overwintering in Alaska. And it was a it was an immature rufus that that has spent the winter in Kodiak, and uh, they don't breed on Kodiak. There was there was one bird that seemingly attempted to overwinter in um, Sitka, but it didn't. It wasn't seen after January, so we're not sure if it made it. But um, but that's an interesting an interesting find, and and makes us kind of wonder what's what's going to happen with with rufus in the future uh, fast forward to yesterday and you can see that rufus have have made their way up to juno so at least as far as as the ebird users are concerned um the they have they've made it up to juno and gustavus and and probably the lack of users in between Juno and Cordova, probably Cordova would be our, our next sighting, but usually it's right there at the end of April, early May that we expect the, the first ones to arrive to the Kenai. And so that's the basic biology of Rupus. The next one I wanna talk about is Anna's because a lot of people don't realize we have Anna's here on the Kenai now. And Annas are remarkably different in their strategies than Rufus. So um, these are just some nice photos of Annas. The males have this beautiful kind of rosy fuchsia color, much different than the that orangey, um, orangey fiery red of the Rufus. But and they also get the the um, bright feathers up on top of the head. But for the most part. Most people are seeing a little green job just zipping by, right? And they're so fast and they're so hard to photograph um, that I thought I'd add this one other slide to show you some some differences because it's easy if you have a male come by, but if you have any of these immature birds that just have a couple little couple little spangles on the throat and and they all look 
green and they're going Mach 6. So when you do have a, if, if you have a Hummer um, come in, one of, the, one of the biggest things you want to do is try to get a quick look at the tail to separate these Rufus and Annas. And you can see this is one of the most pale Rufus I can find. And you can still see this Rufus coloring in its tail and, and a little bit on the flanks. And then a friend of, a new internet friend of mine, uh, Thomas, I, I'll, I'll butcher his name too, you know, Gogliardo. Um, he's in Chino, California, and he gets a lot of Annas down there. And so he sent me these wonderful pictures. I asked him for some pictures showing that the tail on, on female and immature Annas. And you can see, you know, there's none of this kind of orangey rufous color in the, in the tail on Annas. So just an important thing, you know, I know a lot of times the birds are so fast, but if you, if you focus on the tail, that may be your best bet at separating these young and, and female birds. So the story of Annas is really fascinating because they, in the 1900s, they were early 1900s, they were accidental in California. And then by 1950, they had made their way up to kind of Northern California. And they just keep making these little jumps. And so I don't know when this range map was, was created, but you'll see they're, they're really not showing Anna's going uh, uh, up into British Columbia very much. And this, this range map isn't that old. Um, one of the reasons for that, I think it's my next, well, nope, we're gonna go to Kenai Peninsula. So like with Rufus, most of the, most of the Annas that we see are in areas where people have feeders. And so people often say that, that Annas are only there because of the feeders, but probably some mix of, of both schools of thought is, is there. If you, if you put up feeders, you're not going to draw birds from somewhere else. You are going to draw birds that were already in your area. And these Annas are, are essentially non-migratory. So they disperse here and then they either hang on and make it or, or they expire. And at some point as the climate changes, they become the pioneers that, that start up a, a new population in a new area. And we do have one sighting out here by Tionic that was a, a field crew out doing um, duck or shorebird work and they didn't have a feeder and they, they got a really nice photo of a, an Anna's out there. So, so we do see Anna's popping up and, and certainly popping up more recently um, in South Central Alaska. And here's probably the one thing that, it, that tells us why we're seeing this sudden new push. And so, you know, I told you in the 50s, they were up to Northern, Northern California, but they really didn't make any push into Oregon, Washington, British Columbia till about 2000. So these are Christmas bird count um, numbers from, from those three zones. And in about 2000, you start to see this little uptick, little upswing in the number of um, Anna's reported on Christmas bird counts. Well, everybody sees hummingbirds and they put out feeders and some combination of, of feeders and climate change produced a massive explosion. Now they're producing. Um, so from 2000, 10, you get this mass production and um, they're actually having two broods in British Columbia now. And there was uh, one instance where they believe that a juvenile born in February, in July, I think it was, a bander caught, caught a juvenile that, that had an egg in it. So um, just this epic explosion of, of production in British Columbia. And so probably that's what we're seeing in Alaska is the results of, of 
this next jump up to, to British Columbia and, and maybe into Southeast Alaska. And so in Alaska, our little uptick in, in Anna's hummingbirds started in 2010 and up, up, up we go. And I didn't get it on the graph, but I believe 2019 was like 41. So it just continues to, continues to follow that trend. So, so the combination of, of British Columbia just pumping out tons and tons of Annas and some of those making their way here um, makes me believe that we'll probably continue to see Annas until, until something drastic changes um, with the, the trend in our climate. So wideband hummingbirds, this is always a good question. Well, it's really fun and just being able to interact and, and um, handle this completely fragile but super super tough bird is is one of the fascinations um the other thing is that they all look the same and i realized as i was looking through all these range maps and counts and different things i couldn't answer the questions i wanted to ask or that i was asking without having individual birds banded and and what that allows us to do is um, see where birds go if somebody else encounters that band somewhere else. But it also allows us to uh, determine if the same bird is returning to the same area. And, and that's kind of an important piece of the puzzle. Are we, are we seeing um, a new, new emigration of Anna's each year or are birds surviving through the winter? And conversely with Rufus, if Rufus are going to start moving, we'd like to know, have a background sense of, of how many return each year to the same breeding area. And then as they advance into new areas, it'll, it'll give us some insight into, into how that advance incurs. Um, so in order to ban hummingbirds, I have to have um, feeders. Um, there's really no other way around it. I've, I've caught a couple in mist nets, but the ideal situation is I have a, an active feeder and I come and I set my trap up and I have two different, two different styles of traps we use and I hang the feeder inside. And then uh, when the hummingbird comes in, I, I close and capture it and, and then do the banding process, which, which we try to, you know, get them out the, out there and flying again within just a couple of minutes because their their high metabolism rate and and all that kind of stuff. So here's just a couple of examples of of traps that that I use. Um, I probably use the the one in the bottom right the most. Um, but you'll notice there each of these have safeguards because. These hummingbirds are so fast that they will try to escape when the door is shutting um, or when this curtain is falling. And so both of these traps have safeguards so that you don't, don't have the ability to squish a bird. This one has a, a loose um, sleeve at the bottom that just hangs loosely. This one has a, the door stops right here. And this has a, a mesh thing so that you can't um, can't harm them in the capture process. Um, then there are, I didn't mention it earlier, but when I finally got my banding permit, there were about 150 banders in the US and Canada that were authorized to do hummingbirds. And now we're fortunate we have three active banders, with, including myself. Um, in Alaska. And so one of the other banders, Kate McLaughlin, lives in Cordova. And she was nice enough to provide me some of her Rufus banding data um, to show some of, the, some of the important things that you learn from these longer term banding projects. So when she was banding in Chiniga, you can see that it took several years of getting, getting some bands out there, some banded birds out there, and then she started getting the return rate. Um, looks like it's approaching, it's in the 20s if you, if you don't factor in those first couple of years that, that you, it takes to get some bands out. 
since she's moved to Cordova now, you're, we're not seeing that same return rate yet, but you can see that that she's gonna this this build up time where you get a portion of the population banded, and then you start recapturing those birds. That takes several years before you you get that volume. Um, but this is the other in, in really unique things that that Kate was able to find. She did catch. Uh, hummingbirds that were either previously banded or she banded them and they were they were either found dead or captured by another bander but they these three all fit into that racetrack model of, of migration so all of this would be kind of what we had expect, expected this one over here we probably didn't really expect this was a bird that that overwintered in Tallahassee Florida and then was was recaptured in Chiniga. So that's one of the longest distance, um, certainly the longest distance hummingbird band recovery we've we've ever had. But it also, you know, it, it begs the question: Are are Alaska hummingbirds more consistently utilizing these Gulf states, or are the a bulk of them going to Mexico and? Um, only just an occasional one using using these Gulf states. So fun, fun stuff, and I and, uh, just look forward to, to getting some more birds banded myself and, and seeing if I find some similar results from Chiniga with, with the rest of the Kenai Peninsula. This is one of the, I, I, I don't put a lot of time into modeling. It's really not one of my fortes, but um, this was a model put out by Audubon looking at, at changing climate temperatures and what that meant for different bird species. And this was specifically Rufus. And what the model seemed to indicate was that a lot of the areas um, that they currently live in now, both both on the breeding grounds, but really on the wintering grounds, those were going to um, be much less hospitable and not and not really be sustained. And so, um, you know, we're we're expecting with climate change to see a huge reduction in rufous population, but we're also going to see a a shift a shift into you know further north latitudes and a loss of of some of that southern zone and that and unfortunately it, you know if the if the models are correct we'll we'll see a total overall reduction because we'll see more loss on the back end than we see gain on the upper end but you know that's highly speculative and and the main thing that i wanted to use this for was to show that that under those scenarios we do see rufus moving into some unique areas even across the inlet in uh, Lake Clark, um, Iliamna Lake area. So, you know, my main focus was, was here on the Kenai. When are we, what, what conditions are we going to see change that start producing Rufus up, up to Anchor Point or up to the Kenai or, or out in the Nikiski area? And, and same thing for, for up by Anchorage. But at least the models, the models indicate that what I kind of envision happening is, is, you know, within the purview of what the model said, too. So um, I'm looking forward to, to seeing that change actually happen in real life. And one of the, one of the limiting factors, seemingly limiting factors, um, every place that we see rufous breeding in earnest we see early flowering species like i mentioned before salmon berries and currants and and salmon berry seems to be a big one so uh, a new friend of mine down from from bc he confirmed and he took this photo just i think it was april 10th he took this photo in bc and he said yeah as soon as the as soon as the salmon berry flowers pop, everybody expects that they should be seeing rufous shortly. So that doesn't fit for the Western Kenai because um, we, 
if we had salmon berries up up the western western um, Kenai Peninsula, we would we would all know about it. But we know we have to get over to Seldovia or, or somewhere else to get salmon berries. So um, I did find another photo from from May early May 2010 down in Anchor Point. Um, and it shows a, a male rufus feeding on what appeared to be felt leaf willow. But it was that kind of aha moment that, you know, we always see um, willow inflorescence out even before, before salmon berries or currants or anything. So, so we do have a food source um, that may allow them to expand into, into other areas of the Kenai Peninsula. So um, I'm not worried about that part of it, though I would love to have salmon berries um, out in my yard. And then I don't have a ton of return data. Um, I wanted to share my banding experiences so far. And, and so in 2018, I got my permit after Rufus had already left. So Rufus, Rufus arrive in early May, the males leave by July 1st, and then by July 15th, everybody else takes off, the, the females and the youngsters. So when I got my permit in 2018, they had already departed. In 2019, I was all set to go and ban Rufus and, and Seward, and the Swan Lake fire happened. And not only did that restrict my ability to, to move over to Seward, I had to I had to work on the fire a bunch. So in 2019, I only banded, I think, five, five Rufus. They had all left the day before I got there and, and, and headed south and, and east. So last year, 2020, was my first real year in earnest to be able to put effort into identifying a couple of sites that I could consistently band at from, from year to year. And and I did pretty good. I got 178 or well, 172 rufus banded last year. And if you're a if you're a local birder to the Kenai Peninsula, you know where where Ava's house is in Seward. Um, that was one of my my hot spots. Ava has a bunch of feeders out, and she usually thinks that she has about 20 to 25 um, hummers coming and. Over the course of maybe four or five visits to our house, I banded 80 at, at Ava's house. So, um, like I said, it's important to ban them because they um, they all look the same. And then the other important place I banded was Alaska Wildlife Conservation Center in Portage. And, and we've always known that they were in Portage. Um, but this was... Um, this was uh, our first pilot attempt to see if if we could um, safely ban hummingbirds there and maybe maybe have an opportunity to share that with the public and and it was really successful so we'll look to continue that again this year uh, and then just a couple of couple of others that I picked up in in other areas and some of the cool things that I found out so far well. There was one other bander years ago that stopped in at Ava's and banded, banded some birds a couple of years. And, and the first year I hit Ava's, I, I catch one of these birds that, that was previously banded um, and it was eight years old, um, just right off the bat. And, and the record is a little over nine now, I think nine and a half, maybe, maybe, maybe pushing 10 even, but, but these are relatively long lived birds for, for the size and what they're up against and, and where they're headed uh, for migration. So fascinating to realize how, how long lived they are. I did, like I said before, I only caught five um, birds in 2019. So I did recapture one of them. Um, the Cannery Road record, I don't really spend too much time worrying about records, but it was the westernmost uh, rufus ever banded um, in North America. And then, you know, what I found most fascinating was being able to compare to the other banders along the migration route. So in 2020, 
here I banned 80 adults at, at uh, one site and 40 at another. And I realized I didn't have enough bands for all the babies that these, these adults are going to be cranking out. And so I started making more bands. I ordered more bands. And then when the, the nesting season was over and, and all these fledglings should have been coming in, I didn't catch hardly any. I didn't catch anything in comparison to the number of adults that, that I banded earlier in the, in the spring and summer. Yet, as you move down the migration route to Cordova, Kate's catching a ton of youngsters. So it, it makes us believe that here at the end point of, of migration, as soon as they fledge, they start moving up the, up the mountainsides and, and into those alpine areas to, to feed on the flowers and fatten up and, and, and start moving south. And so she's catching them during migration um, but I'm not, and there, you know, that's, that's just our first year of data, but um, it will be interesting to see if that is a, a continuing trend, and I, I won't have to, have to worry about having a huge allotment of bands uh, for all the juveniles being born, because they, they just don't come into the feeder right away. And switching over to Anna's, so like I said, I did catch, I, I Anna's come in September, October generally, and then they hang on until, until they either don't make it or they make it through the winter. Um, the first year I banded to 2019, I caught two more. And then 2020 was just a banner year for Anna's. And I didn't even catch a, a fraction of what was kicking around the Kenai. Um, I caught eight and six of those were down in Homer. But at the time we were banding in Homer, we we knew about, I think, at least a dozen birds um, in various areas around Homer. So um, 2020 was it was a much bigger year than we've ever seen for Anna's. And there were a lot of um, Anna sightings up and down the western coast of, of the Kenai Peninsula. And in a lot of cases, I wouldn't hear about them till Tell the birds had already left. You know, somebody had two or three annas coming to their feeder, and then they left. And then a week later, I heard about it. So um, I have started up a, a Facebook group to to try to get the word out there more and and um, get more of those timely timely updates. But I'm really expecting us to continue to see annas each year. Uh, and and if we have a warm a warm winter. In British Columbia, they're nesting starting in January, and they're nesting January, February, March, and then they're done as the as the rufus arrives. So, I think we probably would see something similar here, and and none of us probably believe we have nesting weather in January yet. But but that's that's the deal with annas. They're they're strange, strange little birds. So so far not documented overwintering by by catching a banded bird that I that I banded in a previous year but uh, again we put out a lot more bands this this winter this fall and winter and so um, I think we'll just be continuing to increase our our chances of of catching those um, I think we're going to continue to see more and more chances each year to to have a bird make it through the winter and then one thing interesting, now that I had, you know, eight or 10 different birds to look at down in Homer, we started noticing that, that some of the immature males would just molt right away in November and they'd get the full pink head. And other immature males, it was March and they still hadn't started molting. And so there's some strange molt timing differences between these birds. And it makes me think there's a possibility that they're coming from different different source populations. So um, just a lot, a lot of really cool and interesting stuff. We still still want to learn about Anna's, but um, we're, we're, we're getting enough samples now. We're starting to find some of these, these cool stories about them. And I just, you know, just a couple more photos. I, I like to. I like to show people what it looks like out at the banding station because in most cases, 
I'm going to somebody's private house and I really can't have guests and COVID times were made that even, even tougher. There was only certain houses that I could that I could go to if they had a, a deck and had their feeder up on a deck. I wasn't, I wasn't going to be able to come inside or do anything like that. So COVID really severely restricted um, my, my ability to interact with the, with the host, but we were able to, to do some banding at, at the Wildlife Conservation Center in Portage. And, and that was a great opportunity to, to be outside and, and share these with, with folks. There's just a nice, um, you'll find when you uh, go to the Wildlife Conservation Center, there's always one, one or two real bullies of the feeder and these, these males and they, they will not let other males come into that feeder, but they'll let all the females come in. So um, this was just one of the, one of the real tough guys that um, you always catch them first. And, and he was just a hunter. And here's this shows a little bit, of, this is it banding at Ava's house in Seward and just shows a little bit of the diversity. Both of these are adult females. Um, but you can see the one on the right just has this warm, buffy, buffy tones to it. And the one on the left is just super clean. And um, but she does have gorget feathers. You know, again, they're they're gorget feathers, but they're centrally located on the throat. So that tells you it's a female. Um, just nice, nice opportunity to see them up close. And when you do get lucky enough to to entice a hummingbird to your feet or one of the one of the best parts of the deal is, is you know, finding a way to, um, we, we did hand cleanser and a bunch of different stuff to, even in COVID times, to be able to let you um, release the bird. And, and it's, it's nothing more than, than setting, setting this hummer in your hand until, until it's ready to take off. But it's incredible just to feel the, the little motor running in these guys with, you know, their heart is, um, beats way way faster than any other critters that you're you're used to holding so just to wrap up this part of it the future of rufus on the kenai when ava started putting out feeders in seward she put them out and because she had a couple of very late rufus that were hitting her flower patches in the in the late summer and fall Fast forward a few years and, and they returned as breeders to her house. And then last year I banded 80 there in, in like four or five visits to her house. We're now starting to see those late Rufus sightings outside of their breeding range on the Western Kenai Peninsula with more regular occurrence. And I think it's just probably a matter of time before we start seeing Homer and Anchor Point and who knows, maybe maybe Cooper Landing or or um, Moose Pass or something be be the the direction that Rufus can you know start to expand onto the rest of the Kenai. Um, and Anna's, um, like I said, they're non-migratory, but the amount of production that's being kicked out in British Columbia and and some of those birds dispersing here. I think it's a matter of time before we have uh, one of these milder winters and, and we actually see them attempt to, to nest here on the Kenai in the, in the January, February, March time frame. So um, who knows, but what we have, we have yet to, to still document them overwintering, but we're, we're getting a lot closer and we're getting a lot more, more chances at those attempts. And lastly, if you do want to feed, um, it's super easy. There, you don't use anything but four parts water, one part uh, white sugar, granulated, you know, regular regular sugar. Don't use any of the raw sugars. They they all have different things, different um, base minerals or other things that are that are hard on a hummingbird. But but granulated white sugar most closely matches the nectar that they're getting out of a, a flower and they have to be cleaned. Um, when we're talking in the fall, I say clean weekly is probably okay. When it gets warmer, you, you're probably gonna wanna clean it more often. Down in the, 
Now, when you live in the lower 48 and you're in the 80s to 100s, they're cleaning them every day. So if that's not your gig, don't do it. Um, you also need to, you know, we're talking sugar water. Bears on the Keen are notorious for, for hitting other kind of feeders, and they certainly will, will hit sugary feeders. So if you don't have a safe place to do it, don't do it. The birds don't need us. They're doing just fine. Um, we do this so that we have an opportunity to, to interact with them. And, and for me, it's an opportunity to, to catch them and put a band on and, and get them out there flying again. So there's my contact info if anybody wants to write that down. And we can certainly email or share that out too as well if you are banding on the Kenai. And I mean, if you're banding, if you're feeding on the Kenai and you get a hummingbird, I'd love to love to hear about it. And just a quick little, I know we're getting getting a little late on time. This is a this was a quiz that I set up for when we had in-person meetings. Um, but we're we're reduced to the Zoom thing. So I'm not going to ask everybody to hold up their hand, but if you do want to, if you do want to play the challenge, you can certainly uh, type in the uh, name that you think this is in the chat bar. But um, each of these hummingbirds have a, a kind of a unique story. So this, I will leave it up there for about five seconds, that's probably twice as long as you would have had to see the bird in, in real life anyway. Um, but this is a Costas hummingbird and it's a desert hummingbird from, from California, um, Nevada zone. And we've had three, four, maybe even five sightings here on the, on the Kenai Peninsula of birds that have dispersed here. So fascinating not something that we expect to to come up here but but they are occasionally seen every couple of years on the Kenai next one if you grew up on the east coast you'll know this one right off the bat um, it's the only hummingbird that they tend to have breeding on the on the eastern half of the U.S. this is a ruby-throated hummingbird and this one was photographed in Homer two summers ago. And it was photographed by a lady staying at a, at a bed and breakfast up on the hill above Homer. And she just went out in the morning and took some photos. And back in when she was back in Georgia, and I think it was November, she shared with some of her friends. And they said, that's her ruby throat. You need to tell folks about it. So we have seen, we, well, we haven't. This one woman has seen a ruby throat at Hummingbird. Um, but they have been documented in Homer. So um, that's a fascinating one. This is a calliope hummingbird. I, we do not have them in Alaska. These were some, some birds from my, from my training time, but this is just um, the smallest hummingbird. One step up from the, the bee hummingbird down in Cuba, this, this calliope. I banded calliopes that were, I think, 2.4 grams, which is basically just slightly lighter than a penny. And uh, so anyway, calliopes are up, up in Idaho, and, and they, they go a little further north than that, but, but we don't have any, any Alaska hope right away, but a beautiful bird. And the other one I banded a lot of down in Idaho was a Again, we don't have any we don't have any records in in Alaska yet. Uh, probably not too likely, but you just never know. So now I think I'm gonna open it back up for questions. If uh, Teresa has any in the chat there, that um, oh yeah, we we definitely have some questions. Uh, so the first the first one was simply, can you go back to one of the first slides that you did where you had a whole bunch of hummingbirds and name the species in the photos? And I don't know if they were all um, Rufus and and it's like it's like almost your I, first or second. That was slide. my training day photo. Well, <laughs> training training week, the best road trip I ever had. There we go. That one, yeah. Yeah. So. So Rufus is, is, you know, this guy on the, in the middle, that's my target here on the Kenai. Orange, there, there are some Rufus in different parts of their zone. 
ours tend the males tend to be rufous all the way down the back but they do have um places where they'll get green down the back as well so that's a just a fascinating little little tidbit on rufus this is the calliope that we just talked about this is the black chin we talked about this i can't quite see but i believe that's a female calliope um, that was the very first bird I banded um, in like Pocatello, Idaho. And um, so Fred held it up there as a, as a um, commemorative shot. And then I believe this is a broad-tailed hummingbird, um, kind of similar to, to a female rufus. And this is what you'll see with, with rufus as well. And, and, Without seeing the rest of it, I'm just going to say I think this is a broad tail that's possible. This is a rufus. But, but the point of, of showing this photo really was that, that the rufus in the tail is, is really evident in, um, in female and juvenile rufus, even though I think this is a broad tail that also shows that. So, yeah, good questions. Good question. So um, let's see. The second one was why are Anna's here now? So why why do they think that they're migrating up here? Well, they're they're. I guess the you know the term migration versus dispersal. Those are 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 two things that we should probably sort out first. Migration is is a very intentional thing that's been developed over millennia and and probably ice ages and and things like that and where ice free zones probably dictated why a bird would migrate from the tropics and to Alaska to take advantage of the bugs and and then go back and so there was there's a very intentional thing with migration with dispersal almost all birds have a dispersal mechanism that that pushes birds out into territories they maybe didn't occupy before. And in a lot of cases, with a bunch of the songbirds, maybe they send out 5% of their, their population are, you know, what we would always call, oh, they, they migrated the wrong way, or they did this or that. But what they are is they're this, this dispersal. And in most cases, the, the climate or habitat in that area they dispersed to wasn't hospitable for them to to occupy it and then they end up dying or or moving on that's a that's a normal uh, a normal thing that birds do to to send out pioneers basically and so then when that climate changes or becomes more suitable then all of a sudden they're the heroes because they just populated a new area while while the old area is, is kind of going away and so that that function of dispersal is normal it's the explosion of birds now wintering, breeding, and living in, in British Columbia. That's probably why we're seeing more and more birds disperse. And they're, they're also dispersing inland. So Idaho is kind of tracking exactly like we were. I think they banded uh, in Idaho, they had banded 58 birds, which was this new, like, wow, we're getting, we're getting Anna's in Idaho. And now Idaho has um, its first and second nesting record of Anna's. Um, so, so I think Idaho is just a little, a, a few steps ahead of us, but we're probably, we're probably kind of tracking the same as Idaho being on the, the fringe of this core breeding area and getting pioneers coming out and then eventually Eventually, they take hold where they land. Good. And then how long does it take to migrate down south? Those are some pretty long migrations. How, how long does it take that guy to get to Florida? <laughs> well, we can go. We can go to, I don't know if Kate's, I don't know if the date's on her. If we look at this map. And Kate's, Kate's uh, was, out, was out there. She was... Hello, and uh, you mentioned her. Oh, good, good, good. Yeah, if we look at this map, you can see that, you know, the, the, the racetrack model still indicates, you know, that early May they're arriving up here in southern Alaska, which is just about the same time frame that we're seeing them. So, and then they turn around and leave in July. And so, 
they're saying September or so they're arriving at the winter ground. So that's probably holds pretty true. They're leaving here in July and they're bebopping from flower to feeder to flower to feeder all the way down till they till they get to the wintering grounds in, in September. <coughs> oh, sorry about that. Joys of the joys of living at home. Uh, my my dogs are gonna start barking in a minute too. <laughs> Okay, dog taken care of. There we go. <laughs> any, any more good questions out there that we can answer? Yeah, um, and so you answered the how long do they live, but the, the question was, what's the lifespan and breeding period for each of the two species? They're both, I think, I don't think the banding records, I don't know how long they, they're effective breeding age is you know there's a lot of species that that take a take a few years to establish themselves as breeders uh, you know grow up to the point where they can start successfully breeding then they have this this honeymoon period where they breed and then they then they maybe have a few more years on the tail end where they where they're not really good at breeding but they're still still kicking around I don't think we have enough data on Anna's because realistically you know, when we look at those at those graphs, they just started moving into into British Columbia in 2000, and probably at first we we didn't even realize this was going to be a permanent thing. Um, and comparing what what they do down in Arizona and California is probably not fair. Um, looking at our climate and what's what's involved in surviving through the winter, so um, there are eight, nine-year-old records of, of Anna's. And, you know, like I said, they, they actually have what they believe in British Columbia was a juvenile that was already building an egg in its first year. Um, so I don't know, that's kind of crazy, but, but, um, but certainly their second year, they're gonna start breeding. And so, um, what does that give you? Six or seven good years of of, of replicating yourself? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it says, are you determining breeding area from plumage of sighted birds or from something else like documented nests? So that's an awesome question. Finding nests so far on the Kenai has been brutal. They either are nesting too high or I'm just not spending enough time looking for nests because I've actually spent a little time trying to find nests. But, but what I do see at all my banding sites where I have good numbers is, especially in Seward um, and a little bit in Hope, I will be banding birds at the feeder and not 30 feet away is a male doing these giant, beautiful dive displays where they, they fly up and then they zing down and they make this chirp, 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 chirp sound with their tail. And they basically drive the female right down to the ground or to a lower branch, just six inches off the ground. And then, and once he's impressed her enough, then they go and mate. And so I'm actually seeing, um, seeing the birds mating at several of my banding sites in Seward. And, and one of the coolest ones, they were doing it underneath this giant uh, Sitka spruce canopy. So it was all kind of dark under there. And he was doing these big giant loops, um, making this whistling sound with their, with their tail and wings. And he was doing these loops underneath the canopy and, and um, impressing this female. So that's what we're seeing. We do occasionally also get eggshell fragments on the females when they come into the feeder if the if they've been brooding and then and then the eggs hatch, I'll often see a couple of little eggshell fragments that stay stuck on there for a couple of days. So that's one of our one of our other nesting nesting indicators. Okay. And do you recommend putting out feeders as well as having flowers to attract like fuchsia? So do you recommend planting the right flowers along with the feeders? 
Yeah, definitely. And 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 like I said, the 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 feeders the feeders are um, the feeders are for your enjoyment. They're for my research project to to try to have more opportunities to ban hummingbirds. But undoubtedly, if you want to just stick with with doing flowers and not doing the the hummingbird feeder maintenance and all that kind of stuff, I totally get it. And most of the sites where people have done really, you know, where they have good feeders, especially here on the Kenai, they have phenomenal flower beds too. And there's always nasturtiums and, and you know, some of the other tube flowers that, that um, stay late, you know, um, because because for the most part in the in the central Kenai and northern Kenai zone, we're really not expecting to see rufous breeding here right away. Um, so it's the it's the post breeding migrants that you're going to pick up on the rufous side. So that's going to be a, a July, <clears throat> rarely into August will we see any rufous, and then Anna starts showing up in August and September and October and then they stay. And so um, it's those flowers like nasturtiums that can hang on pretty late into the season um, that, that tend, to, tend to draw them in. Okay. And then Linda asked, are you marking them with a dot on top of their head as well? And what does that tell you? Good question. And a lot of the photos you will see, um, I put a light blue, um, dot on top of the head and what especially on Anna's what that does is a if I've already caught the bird and I see that it's a it's a bird I've already captured I don't have to capture it again the bands are really difficult to see and so in order to avoid um, capturing the bird again and again and again and going oh this is the one I already caught over at this guy's house and and now he's at a, at a new house to avoid that, I put the little marker on there. And then also it helps the homeowner tell me that, you know, we we had the one with the little blue dot coming in and now we have a different one that doesn't have it. And and I can then go to their house expecting that, that this is an unbanded bird or he's molted and this might be a bird that I banded the previous winter. And, and that's that's the ultimate goal is to, to catch those ones that that we already banded from a previous winter and then we know they they overwintered but that's that's the reason for the little dot on the head it when they molt it they get a whole new set of feathers and and in those annas that i banded in seward and homer that were undergoing molt i would i would band them as a as a juvenile male and then all of a sudden three weeks later they had their whole headdress and everything and then no no blue dot. So in some cases it, it goes away pretty quickly if they're if they're molting. Okay. Um, and the next one says, oh, what do Anna's eat in the wintertime if they overwinter here? They eat a ton of bugs. And what we've what we've seen is we've seen them gleaning from from the spruce trees. What we're hoping is at some point. Um, I catch some that that deposit enough of a fecal sample we can do DNA, but but in British Columbia and, and other areas, they spend, you know, they're probably estimates of 60 to 70 percent of their daily intake of uh, caloric intake is actually insects. And in, in a lot of cases, they're just gleaning frozen little spiders and diptera and stuff from the from the spruce trees. And what we do know, like when we know the feeders, you know, have to be helping because there are not a lot of nectar sources that time of year. But the one, the one Anna's that I banded in, in where was that? Kenai, Cannery Road area. I banded it in October and in early November, we had a big snowstorm and, and they didn't see him anymore. They said, oh, I think, I think he didn't make it. And then about a week later, he showed up and he he came and hit their feeder for a couple of days and then he took off again. They said, oh, it got cold. He's done. And Thanksgiving, he showed up again. There weren't a lot of other feeders around that neighborhood um, at that time because people really didn't know that 
in November and December, you could put out a hummingbird feeder and, and have any reliable chance. I, I really think they were probably one of the only ones feeding. So they were spend, he was spending sometimes up to two weeks away from the feeder, um, just, just subsisting on, on wild foods and then coming back for three or four days to top up and, and then take off. And the last time they saw him was Christmas Eve. Um, but given his absences and stuff, I don't know that I don't know that I would consider that they aren't making it and just moving moving to Homer or, or something else at that point. So anyway, that's what they're eating in the wintertime. Thank you. And let's see, there was one more. There's there was one more. Somebody said, uh, Jamie said, I remember seeing hummingbirds in Sitka back in 1972. Not sure what species, but how common were they back then? Rufus had been common um, back then for sure, all the way up into Prince William Sound. So, so Rufus really haven't made any big moves outside of, of what we know. Um, I've started reaching out. I was, I was fascinated by the idea that maybe um, some of our um, elders from the various areas maybe have stories passed down, um, you know, through, through their culture about hummingbirds. So down in South um, Pacific Northwest, like the Haida have, have really tremendous um, stories about um, Rufus hummingbirds. And, and I believe they do when you get up into Southeast Alaska and the Tlingits and, but I'm, I'm actually in the process of reaching out to um, the various native communities to find out um, if they have hummingbird stories in their culture to give us a sense of, of whether hummingbirds have always been here in Prince William Sound and the outer Kenai Peninsula, or if that's a new thing from the last hundred years, you know. So I, we definitely know they were in Southeast back, back in the day. Wow. Well. Well, and then the, the last one should be a really simple one. I think on one of your slides, you used an acronym HY and somebody asked what that meant. Yeah, that's a, a dumb, uh, dumb bander term that I shouldn't probably put in there. HY is hatching year. And so uh, Rufus hummingbirds are born in, let's see, they arrive in May. So they're born in, in late May, early June. And then from June all the way till December 31st, that would be their hatching year. And so after January 1st, that would, that would be um, an after hatch year. So hatching year is just another, another term for a, a juvenile hummingbird that we can tell it was the, the year that they, they were born. Okay, Can let's see. I think that was the last question. Can you go to the thank you slide, please? Yes, yes, yes. I should have been there already. Okay, I'll make you go to the slide just so I can thank you. <laughs> thank you again to our speaker for donating his time for this great presentation. We know it takes a lot of time in, to put these slides together and, and clearly you, you've put a lot of effort into this. So thank you so much. In a virtual world, our speakers can't hear any applause. So if you'd like to send any verbal applause or comments, please type them in the chat and we will share this with Todd. Also include where you're from if you get a chance. It's really interesting for us to see where people are tuning in from. While you do that, I'd also like to thank AWA members who are out there who make these presentations possible. We're a local nonprofit that relies on membership donations to make our programs, especially Wildlife Wednesdays, possible. We work really hard to keep these events free and open to the public, and we've been able to do that because of your support, so thank you. If you're not an AWA member but would like to join um, to make these presentations keep going, you can join through our secure online platform on our website. Um, at https www.akwildlife.org, take action or by mail. We're in the process of starting a Kenai area chapter um, some at some point and would love to see some membership from, from locals out there. So, so let us know if you're interested in that too. Thank you very much, everybody.
Todd, you did a spectacular job. That was very, very interesting. Thank you, thank you. And I will stop sharing my screen here. There we go. Yeah, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Hopefully everybody's, everybody seems to be putting a whole bunch of information in the chat. So you should get some really good information. Yeah, I, will, I will mute mine and kind of read. Also, if anybody missed my contact info, just remember that um, this will be rec is recorded and will be posted, and so you can jump on there and and find my uh, find my contact info. So, uh, with that, I'll leave and have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll stay on long enough until I see the last person uh, sort of being done with the chat and then I will stop the recording.